We lived in a two-room apartment. I mean, that was middle class. Uh, in one of the rooms um, was the kitchen, my father's tailor shop, and in the second room we had the um, living room, the reception room, and the and the bedroom. And so, and there was no, uh, there was running water and electricity in our in our place in our house, but there was no uh, toilets. It was an outhouse. And so we were living. I have five brothers and my father and my mother were seven people living in the two rooms. So we were sleeping uh, seven people in one room. And uh, of course, um, like we live over here, uh, you know, every child has a room at least, and always a room and probably a study room depending on where, how and when. But over there, we were, uh, like I said, the bedroom was, uh, during the day, it was a living room and a reception room. And at night, it was the bedroom. And so we had seven people living in, that, in the bedroom. But we were happy. We knew anything. That, that was the life. And, and, and that's what we were used to. I attended school. And... Uh, I was active even as a youngster, uh, participating in uh, different sports and um, belonging to organizations. And then came World War II, September 1st, 1939. When World War II broke out, I was 14 years old. Uh, the city of Plotsk being uh, 90 kilometers from the German border, uh, it took the German army three days to occupy, to get to the city of Plot. So on the 3rd of September, I mean, yes, on the 3rd of September, the German army occupied the city of Plotsk. And then everything, of course, changed. Um, the first day when the, when the regular army came in, yeah, they were just there very briefly because they moved on with the front line. But behind them came the occupation forces, consisting of um, SS. And I see in back you have the black uniform, uh, the Gestapo, and the, the occupation. They were mean. And then all with them came all the bad laws, especially the Nuremberg laws. The Nuremberg was number one, were depriving us of our civil rights. Uh, with all due respect, being an American, you uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't realize, because it's difficult for one that doesn't live under those circumstances to know what it means to live, to lose your civil rights. You are nothing, you are nobody. Anybody can do with you whatever they want. Anybody can take away from you whatever they have. You have no recourse. You cannot sue anybody. You cannot complain. You're, you're nothing. You're just a living um, um, human being. But they're not being, you're not being treated as a human being any longer. And that was very, that was the bad thing. Um, there were mm, many, many restrictions. Uh, number one, um, we were not allowed to have um, any businesses, any properties, uh, any foreign currency. Uh, schools were closed during the summer, but were not uh, reopened in September, which is usually the time when the schools reopen. And so there was the uh, education was interrupted. There was no more education. And the um, Nazis, especially the SS, <coughs> were very brutal and um, doing terrible things, beating, torturing. A ghetto was formed, ordering all the Jewish people from the city of Plotsk to assemble in a certain section, a certain area. And, and then they had to bring in people from outside area or from the nearby villages. And so now they say that we were living in a two-room apartment, seven people. 
they brought in other people and we had to take in another family, probably of the same size. So imagine now you had, you could have 10, 12, 14 or more people living in a two room apartment, or you had a one room for the whole thing. And, um, and, and the, um, uh, Food supply were getting shorter and shorter and less and less. And then uh, you had to report the, especially men from the age of uh, 15, 16 to 45 or 50 had to report for work. In order to get a uh, food card, you had to report for work. If you didn't, so you didn't get the food card, so you couldn't get any food. Um, what was the work? Some of them, of course, there's always something that is needed, but most of the time it was just to discriminate, just incriminate the people to uh, do uh, things that were not necessary at all. For instance, uh, let's say there were a pile of rocks. We were ordered one day to take the rocks and carry him by hand, say a little distance. The next day we had to bring him back. Uh, they speak specially on the uh, religious people uh, to give them, to dehumanize them. For instance, they gave him a bucket with water and a brush to scrub the, the streets. Um, and um, beating and torturing and people started to disappear. And so in the middle of the night, um, SS men with uh, dogs and uh, flying rifle butts ordered everybody out without prior warning. We had to leave everything behind. Imagine where you have <clears throat> in your family, I don't know, probably from generations, items or things, but whatever it is, it is to you could be sentimental, although maybe not of monetary value, but of sentimental value. But here you were ordered to leave everything behind and leave the leave your house. From there we were assembled in the uh, on the streets and shipped out to a uh, concentration camp to a camp. At that time, it was not a concentration camp. It was a transit camp in East Prussia. In 1941, in a villa called Van Zee in uh, the outskirts of Berlin, a, a, a group of assessment were assembled with the orders from Himmler to work out uh, the final solution of the Jewish question. And so after a while there, a bunch of drunken assessment uh, declared the final solution and that the Jewish people, those that are now under the German occupation and those that will come under the German occupation uh, later on have to be exterminated. And so in 1900, in October of 1942, again in the middle of the night, uh, we were ordered out from our homes, leave everything there, assemble in the marketplace where a selection took place. Uh, the young and then those that were capable to work were taken on one side. The very young and the elderly selected on the other side. We were, myself and two of my brothers, were uh, selected among the young ones to go to, to go to work, but I was working already and my brothers also in the ammunition factory. So we were considered workers. My parents, my father, my mother, and my seven-year-old brother with the population, with the entire the same the population of that city was sent to a death camp to Treblinka and they are murdered by uh, gazing and cremated. Um, that was that was probably that was the, the most horrible day of my life, which is still with me. 
I think my parents for the very last time, knowing that I won't see him anymore, and being a teenager, and they were taken away, and um, that's all, we didn't see him anymore. Uh, uh, on the other hand, um, the young people, myself and my two brothers and the others were taken to, to a camp, a prepared, uh, now a slave labor camp, and we were assigned to work in the ammunition factory, which I did work anyways. And that was going on from 42 till 44. In 1944, the um, Russian army was moving uh, west. Now they are already at the Polish border, coming, you know, occupying Polish cities. And so uh, the Germans started to liquidate the concentration camps. And uh, we were taken out from there and sent to the final destination. We knew that Auschwitz is the final solution, that their guest chambers stay in crematoriums and that this is going to be the final solution. And after, on the third day we arrived, I remember early in the morning, and in a, in a place he was in, uh, around, around it were uh, wires and we could see inside people with the striped uniforms and, um, and now we knew that this is Auschwitz. Again coming off the train that we were unloaded and then there was a selection by the uh, infamous Dr. Mengele, you must have heard about him, about Dr. Mengele who with the uh, movement with the point of one finger decided who was to live and who was to die. So there again, there were two columns who that does, in his opinion, are capable to work. And the others went one direction and we went the other direction. Uh, we never saw the people that were in the other column again. We knew where they, where they were taken. Uh, my column were taken into the camp and were placed in, in Auschwitz, where we were greeted, number one, with the sign that you probably know by now, which says, uh, Arbeit macht frei, free through be through work. And the greeting that we received was, uh, we were told, you are in Auschwitz now. That came out, like, you're in the army now. You're in Auschwitz now, and the only, out, the only way out of here is through the chimneys. You know what it means, the chimneys, that means with the smoke. And there were four large chimneys that you could see the smoke and fire coming out from it. And um, so I said the other column went a different direction. We never saw them again. I was placed on a, on a barrack and, uh, and my two brothers and uh, we were assigned to work. Now about the conditions in Auschwitz is just impossible to describe. To know that such a place ever existed on this planet, operated by human beings, by a government, the atrocities, what took place there is just unbelievable and cannot be described. Uh, you, must, uh, you must remember that in Auschwitz was not only Jews. There were all nationalities, even prisoners of war. Uh, there was a large uh, group of Russian prisoners of war. Uh, there were uh, Americans. There were, uh, like I said, nationalities from all over the world. And the guest chambers were working every day, transports were arriving, where they were bringing people. Again, the same thing, the young and the elderly were taken to the guest chambers, gas cremated, the ashes spread into the river Visla, or used for fertilizer. And, um, and that's, um, 
that what was going on and there were people being murdered day in and day out and the life and circumstances are undescribable. There were people that uh, you had every day, you know, the wires that were uh, around Auschwitz were the high voltage wires. <laughs> and so people, some people that couldn't take the atrocities and the torture and the uh, lack of food who throw themselves on the high voltage wires because they said, what's the use? That it, nobody comes out from here until 1944, and from there we were sent deep into Germany to work there. Because even, uh, even while the Allied armies were in the West were already on the German border or part of Germany and the East, the Russian, but Hitler, you know, was still promising the German people that they will win the war that he is working on a secret weapon. Well, it one that at that time was the V1 and V2 with, uh, uh, what's his name, Werner von Braun, which then came to the United States and worked for us. But they were also working on the atom bomb, you know, before even uh, the United States worked on it. And uh, so maybe this is what I had in mind, but he said that he's working on a secret weapon and that they still going to win the war. Thank God that they didn't develop the atom bomb. And, but they still made that uh, the slave labor. And so we were sent to Germany and put there to work. Uh, first, I was placed near the city of Stuttgart, where the German built an airfield of night fighters for the protection of the city of Stuttgart. And so we were placed, I was placed there with 600 other people where we built the uh, uh, first uh, a, a, way, a highway for, to bring supplies to the airport. Uh, we had to be ready, that was already the winter 41, 40, uh, 44, 45. We had to be ready when the alarm sound or when the, it was snowing, to be out with shovels and clear the, the runway so that the planes can be ready to take off. They had stationed there night fighters. And, uh, and so we were doing the maintenance there of the, of the highway, build the highway, support that, and things like that. I was working, I was assigned to work in a quarry. You know what, the quarry is breaking stones, from large stone to small to sand to pebble that were being used for the highway. And also um, ready to uh, fix the uh, runway because there were, uh, uh, like for especially the Americans, were bombing the uh, runways, the airfield. And so we had to come out and patch it up and fix it up so that again, so the fighters can get up. And then one day, uh, the uh, American planes came, uh, but that uh, they destroyed everything. And so we weren't needed anymore. And so we were sent to another camp uh, where the Germans were producing. Now, you know, they lost Romania where they were getting the oil, uh, gasoline, oil from there. So now they tried to uh, get uh, oil, shale oil, you know, shale from, shale from rocks. And so they built a factory there. And so we were taken there. But again, that was already 1945. Again, the Americans came. And the Americans were bombing during the day and the British at night or with or vice versa, but the, you, every day there was no German Air Force any longer. Uh, the American planes were flying there at will and bombing destroyed that factory. And so we were not needed anymore. And so now the, the, the end was that we have to be destroyed. The order came from Himmler that no uh, Jewish prisoners should fall into the hands of the Allies. 
and so we were taken on the dead march. And that was the other horrible thing because uh, we were taken to, to a destination where we were to be killed. So we were walking, we were marching down to South Tyrol, South Tyrol or Tyrol, whatever you call it, and they were going to be placed in abundant salt mines and they are destroyed. Uh, on the walking from the camp, um, it was it was horrible because we didn't get any food. In fact, the Germans didn't have any food for themselves. And people were dying. People were being shot. If you if you stepped out from the line, seeing on the street uh, something that you could chew on, a rotten apple or a rotten potato or whatever, and if you went out from line, you were shot there and left in the. The, the highway was lit at with with um, with bodies with people that were killed. In uh, was on the highway through the forest, the black forest. I don't know where they had the Schwarzwald, the black forest. And the camp commandant went up on the on the wagon and said, um, "There is a village ahead here. Uh, the guards are tired, and I know you're tired." All of a sudden, they started to feel sorry for us. Says. The guards are, um, we're going to go into the village to the clean up and refresh. And I order you to get off of the highway to sit at the uh, wayside. So now for the first time in five and a half years, we were going to be free. I mean, they, without the guards, they, they let us sit be free. And he ordered the guards, not as the, so that they shouldn't run, not as losers, but still as a army, ordered them to uh, assemble and other march forward. And of course, as soon as they took the first steps, we started to run in both directions to the forest. I was uh, lucky to get through into the forest, run, and I just ran as far and as deep as I could. Um, I s then later on, deep in the forest, where it's very thick, uh, there were a few other people, four others, and so there were five of us that got together and we uh, uh, decided that we we're going to stick together. And we, uh, it was April, it was cold s to sit the night there. And so we just sat close together to get the body heat from one to another to be able, because we had no winter clothes, we had just those jackets that you see here. And we sat through the night there, and we could hear at the night a lot of the commotion, a lot of the noise on the highway where we came from. But we didn't know what it is. In the morning, uh, we had one guy, uh, we didn't want to go down, but we had one a volunteer who said he's going to climb down and see what's happening on the highway. He went down, and then later he came back like Santa Claus with a, with a blanket over his back and then with all kinds of goodies. He says, uh, the allies are here and there's a truck turned over right at the edge of the forest with all kinds of uh, supplies, with all kinds of goodies, chocolates and uh, canned goods. And so he brought up uh, to us and we sat down, we had a fiesta, ate uh, some of that. And then we went down to the highway and uh, we thought it's American because it was American tanks, American trucks, American uniform, but it was the French. It was the Free French Army.